You're going to love today. You are going to love today. I have with me a wonderful friend of mine from Bulgaria, a pastor from Bulgaria, and his wife, Maxims, Pastor Maxims, and his wife, Theodora. What a, what a wonderful couple they are. And what a beautiful name she has, Theodora. I love it. And we're going to talk about ministry, and he's got questions to ask me. Now, he's got a large ministry in Bulgaria, quite a big ministry. In fact, you're really growing even way more than when I came to be with you years ago. So I'm very proud, very proud of Maxims. Pastor Maxims is very dynamic. I'll, I'll tell you how it started. I was in Thessalonica, Greece, a few years back, and uh, about a 1,000 people from Bulgaria came because it's not too far from northern Greece. And I didn't know who would interpret because we did not know they were coming. So uh, the Greek people were there. I had already an interpreter for the Greek people. But who would interpret for the people from Bulgaria? And he jumped up, and he was dynamic. And I, wow, so we connected, so great. And to Jesus be the praise for all he's doing around the world. And thank you for being our wonderful partners and family. And today, only God knows what will happen. So I'm ready. You want to say a few words, first of all, about your ministry? Well, what can I say? Uh, we've been so blessed to know you for the last 10 years. Obviously, we um, followed you for longer than that. The book, Good Morning, Holy Spirit, and um, the sermons from even the days of OCC. It was so special because we were at Jesus' image yesterday. Yes. Um, amazing work they're doing. It's the first time we, we were at the church. Obviously, we've heard <clears throat> and um, we've seen online their incredible work. That's but it my was children, as you all know. Amazing to be there yeah. Yeah. and to to see that a, a church you built in 84, you built that building in 84. Correct. It's there, and now Jesus' image is using it until they get into the new home, yeah. which is also very exciting that is happening soon. So just to see what the Lord has done in the last 10 years, um, it has been a real blessing. And to see also how you uh, have really be used by God to help the next generation of Holy Spirit. And that's why I'm glad you're with me because you are that generation that the Lord is using. And here are these wonderful people from Europe that God is using. Thousands of people are in his ministries, uh, under his ministry in Bulgaria. Bulgaria is a beautiful country, by the way, beautiful country. Some of the best food I've had, I think, was in in Bulgaria when I came, and I want to come back. I'll be going back to Europe this year. We're going to Poland, we're going to Switzerland, we're going to Paris, France, and Bulgaria now, it looks like so. But uh, I want to have him ask me questions about life and ministry, so let's go. I'm ready for any question. I have no clue what he's going to ask me, but I'm ready for it. And I love that. I love talking to you. One of the best days of my life was... Um, I think seven years ago when we were driving from the sea capital of Bulgaria to Sofia. Yeah. And we had some precious hours and I was asking you so much about life and ministry and the things you told me then, I'm uh, applying them to this day and have been a great foundation for us. I want to ask you this because it's it's almost 50 years now since yeah. you started preaching the gospel. And I think your ministry was counting, your team was counting up to um, a billion, probably a billion and a half. And I think that they just stopped afterwards. But this is over a billion people that you've preached to face to face, not even calculating. That I don't know. Only God knows what the amount is. I told my staff, I have no idea what they <laughs> Yes. All I know is it's in the millions. That's all I know. Yeah, hundreds of millions and billions of people have been impacted by um, your ministry. But I want to ask you something. Tell us something that... People don't know about you because obviously through your messages, your books, everything you've done in your life, we know about Benny Hinn, the man of God. Tell us something we don't know about Benny Hinn. Well, I can tell you one thing people don't know is they don't know my upbringing mm -hmm. quite, uh, quite well. I don't talk about it a lot. Uh, being born in 
uh, in Israel, uh, living through three wars. Uh, that part is nobody knows much about it. But I am who I am because of the way I was brought up by my wonderful mom and dad. You do not even know I was I was Greek Orthodox. Yes, and and, and, and now you guys are Orthodox too. Of course, but you want to say something? I, wa I, I want to hear from you too. By the way, <laughs> wow, well, it's a pleasure. Uh, I mean, every time I'm in a room with generals of God, for me, it's listening is the best thing I can do. So I'm enjoying this time, and we're so thankful we are here. Well, and you're kind. We can spend all this precious time with with you and. Um, but yeah, you were talking about orthodoxy and Bulgaria is an orthodox country, of course. And we had a great conversation about uh, orthodox and Protestantism. And it was very interesting for us to see a different point of view and talking about the unity in the body of Christ. I think that's a really great subject uh, to discuss. And we've been thinking and praying more about this. I think... Yeah, I think I think really people, people don't know this about you. I I want to talk about it. If, yeah. if people who listen carefully to your teaching on uh, Christology, or, or even your teaching on the Holy Spirit, so much of it is orthodox. Very like, much, so. really, really orthodox. Well, what people don't know what what people don't know is my father was deeply involved in the Greek Orthodox Church. Wow. Uh, he was very good friends with all the leaders, including the patriarch himself of Jerusalem, who baptized me. When I was a little boy, he, he gave me his name. So my name, Benny, is from Benedictus. That was his name. So the Greek Orthodox patriarch in Jerusalem was friends with our family. Wow. And because of the closeness with my dad, and my mom, uh, my sister Rose, and myself were baptized by him. And our names were given to us by him. Uh, Rose was his mother's name, so he gave Rose his mom's name at, at, at baptism. And he gave me his name. And once a year we would go to, to what was then Jordan uh, before 1967. The West Bank was under Jordanian rule and only the Christians could visit wow. their families who were across the border, uh, only at Christmas time for three days. Wow. And we were uh, the, one of the families that were allowed as Christians in, in, the, in the Holy Land to visit my mom's family in Ramallah. So when, when Israel became a nation in 48, a lot of Palestinians left wow. and went to Jordan and Syria, Lebanon. And my mom's family left from Jaffa, they were from uh, in, in Jaffa, and they went to what was then Jordan. And they lived in Ramallah for many, many years. Uh, and every Christmas we would go to see them. And when I would go see them, I always went with my uncle, Michel was his name, to see the patriarch of Jerusalem. He wanted to see me once a year, and, and I did. I, I went very amazing. From, and he gave me something very, very special when I was a little boy. He gave me a cross that I still have with a piece of the real cross in it. Wow. Which I don't know how they know it's the real cross, but a very tiny piece of wood, where they would put it in the crosses wow. to people like myself, and, and I was privileged to wear it when I was a kid. How, did, how does it, that's, that's just an incredible genesis of your life and ministry, but what happens then after when you obviously move uh, with your family, and then you meet the more charismatic. Well, I tell of the you church. what happened. I mean, uh, I was also an altar boy at church every you Sunday. Were an altar boy. Yes, for me, for I began. Uh, I recall I was probably ten years old when I began carrying the, the cross at the church, the Greek Orthodox Church in Jaffa, and I was one of the very few kids that actually did it. They would put a robe on me, you know how it is, the Greek Orthodox Church. And I would sit and, and follow the priest, and then after the service, I would always go and eat with the, the deacon that kind of was in charge of the church. They had a beautiful area, they still have a beautiful area in Jaffa, right on the ocean, right by the house of Simon the Tanner. 
uh, what was the house of Simon the Tanner back, you know, years ago, in the in in the Bible days, and I would eat I would eat my lunch right there every Sunday, with the deacon and his wife, was lovely people, but it influenced my life. All that influenced my life, so I became very uh, devout. I was always a devout young boy. Uh, I always made the son of the cross when passing by a Catholic church. I made the son of the cross in Greek, uh, like this, you know, yes, when I passed by the yeah. Greek Orthodox church, everywhere. And that was, that was our life. And, and our whole life was surrounded by the church. Uh, the Greek Orthodox club was over our home. It was a part of our house. So our home was on the lower floor. The, the, the Greek Orthodox club that all, you know, everybody came to was over our house. And the top floor, it's still there, that building is still there, was the treasurer of the, of the Greek Orthodox Church. It was on the, on the top floor. Uh, he was a dear man named Luftalla Hanna. I'll never forget him. And he loved me and I loved him. And he had two boys, uh, Gregory and Mickey. Mickey uh, lives in England today. I wish I could see him. His brother Gregory passed away years ago. They were a lovely family that were very dear to us. And to this day, I, have, I hold very sweet memories in my heart about the people that I, was, I grew up with, you know. I'm sure it, people are listening to this conversation right now and are so I don't think anybody knew about it, yeah. Because they don't know that in your heart, you um, cherish such deep feelings for the Orthodox Church. And more than that, as, as, as a devout Greek Orthodox boy, I knew the Bible really well because I went to catechism with the Catholics and church at the Greek Orthodox on Sunday. So I was influenced by the Catholic Church Monday through Friday wow. in school because a Catholic school and the best schools in Israel are Catholic schools even to this day. And it, it was a French Catholic school, so I, I was fluent in, in French, of course, in those days. And on Sunday, I'd be in the Greek Orthodox Church. And one of the assignments I had as a little boy is to put the life of Christ in, in order in a little book. So I took pictures from the Bible and put them in order in my little book that I had for years. And I can tell you something I was gonna shock you, but anyways, so I put the life of Jesus from his birth to his, to his ascension in a little book that I always carried with me. So I, I knew it by heart and uh, the life of the Lord. And then we moved to Canada in 68, because of the war in 67, my daddy felt he could not raise a family with a lot of wars and such pain and problems in our part of the world. So sad to see even what's happening today. So we immigrated. When we immigrated to Toronto, Canada, you know, um, we brought our culture with us. We had our cousins and our neighbors who moved also from Israel and other parts of the, of the Middle East that we knew. Uh, my my own mom's brother uh, went to Germany from Ramallah and from there came to Canada. So she had her family now again and other family members. So it was like a new life all over again. But we never left our culture and Greek Orthodox Church was dear to us. So I, I, I attended the Greek Orthodox Church on Young Street wow. in, in, in Canada. In fact, before we left, Israel, we, 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 it was such a, a painful experience in 67 and after 67 that I prayed, I said, Lord, help us leave. And if you'll help us, I'll, I'll bring you a big jug of oil to the church. Because, you know, they, they use oil. Yes. Uh, uh, and one thing you didn't know that I'll tell you, and maybe people don't know that, I was the only boy for years that would go and get the holy fire from Jerusalem. No, stop yes, it. Uh, so stop it. now you're going to tell me that you believe in the Holy Fire. Of course I do. I saw it with my own eyes. Absolutely. That's a whole different world there. I, would, I, I was chosen by the church to be, because my dad and the committee would always go to, yeah, the, the Holy to well, well Fire. before 67, we had to go to the border called Mendelboom, okay. Mend Mendelboom Gate. And I was just a little boy. And we would meet, I have pictures, I, I can show you. We would meet the delegation from the Jordanian side that brought the fire. And we would take that fire in, they would give us the, what do you call them, lanterns? 
and we take them to every church on the way to Jaffa. We would stop in 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 Ramleh and Lod and different places, and they would be waiting for the holy fire to light it up. And they they kept that holy fire for a whole year going, as you know. And I was the only boy in that group. That's and amazing. I, and and when we would go to Jerusalem uh, for 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 Christmas, my uncle would take us to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And I knelt by the tomb more than once. And you could see the cracks in it where the fire came out. And one year there was a there was a, a, a kind of an argument between the Greek Orthodox Church and the other churches on the Holy Fire. And they had some kind of a disagreement on was it for real? And they sealed the cracks where the fire came out of. And the fire came right through the gate. It's still there if you go. The main gate of the Holy Sepulchre Church, you see this big crack in the gate with the with the with like black smoke that you can you can do this and it'll come on your hand. And and I mean that was a part of our life. I, I carried that, that holy fire once a year. And I was given a prophecy years ago by a man named Jan Willem van der Ruven. After I got saved, we were talking a few years back in Canada. He said, the day will come, God will use, uh, the Lord will cause fire to come through your life. And, you know, look what's happened. But it's very interesting then. But anyways, that was very much a part of my life. I want to take you a little further in that story because this is like. You did uh, not know that. uh, uh, I'm sure many people did not know that. I promise. And I've read your. I've read. I've read your books, so I know a lot, but this is, I'm so happy that I asked you this first question because I think this is gonna be very interesting for people. But let me ask you this, going forward to your encounter with the Holy Spirit, yeah. you're getting saved, then Miss Coleman, and then the genesis of your ministry um, as a preacher, as an evangelist, um, how did that affect your relationship with the Orthodox Church, because obviously we love the Orthodox. I love the Orthodox. Well, the but patriarch, the patriarch really came. The patriarch, when I got saved, came to Toronto to rebuke me. No. Oh yes, he did. He said, "You left the church, uh, the Greek Orthodox Church, because I got saved." He was very angry with me. The patriarch. The himself. patriarch himself flew from Israel to Canada to rebuke me for leaving the church. I said, "I did not leave the church." I came to Jesus, I found Jesus. He didn't like what I said. But it didn't change the, the relationship with the family. My family was still very devout, Greek Orthodox. They did not know what was happening in my life. My daddy wouldn't even talk to me for two years over it because he was so involved. Know you know what it's like, you know? Was, he's so involved in the Greek Orthodox Church. And to leave the Greek Orthodox Church to them was like, yeah. you know, unthinkable. Like, how dare you kind of thing, you know? But later... I went back to Israel, and I, I spent some wonderful time with the priest who was my priest in the Greek Orthodox Church, uh, who became a very powerful man in, in, uh, in Jerusalem. But he received me with love. Wow. It was a beautiful reunion time, and then he took me to the patriarch. Wow. Uh, which was then, he was in the, the same the patriarch. Next, yeah. And I met the other pat- patriarch, and they all received me with a lot of you know, open arms. So it was cha- it was a beautiful change to to go back, and and he knew exactly what happened to me, our priest. I was talking to to Michael about this yesterday. I was asking him. We were talking within the same lines because he's also Greek and a similar story. That's why we're so close. Yes. So I was asking him. I was saying, I believe that the prayer of our Lord. His final prayer must be fulfilled before the return of Jesus, which is that they all will be one. And when when I studied this passage of scripture, it's an interesting um, interesting verses there because the master actually said, "I pray not only for them, the direct apostles, but only but also for those who will believe through their exactly uh, witness." Yeah. And when you think of it, now the church is really divided with the witness of Paul the Apostle, who was the Apostle to the Gentiles, and this is really the 
Protestant, more evangelical part of the family of God. Peter, who represents the Catholic Church, obviously. And then John, the beloved, is the favorite apostle of the Eastern Orthodox. Do you think that we're living in a time where we will see an opportunity for unity within these different Well, I'll churches. tell you what, what happened when I went to Athens. I, I, I had a big uh, event in Athens at, at, at the stadium. It was packed. And a Greek Orthodox, one of the main Greek Orthodox police was sitting on the front row. That was the beginning of my, and by, by the way, even Michael came to that service. Wow. I will never forget the presence of God so strong when they began singing in Greek, uh, the, the beautiful song, Glory to the Lamb. We have it all, all on tape. And that was the beginning of my uh, coming to the understanding that God was bringing many Greek Orthodox people to himself in a beautiful way. And then I, I went up to, uh, when, when you came, mm -hmm. uh, Thessalonica, and, and you saw what, what happened there. Many of the precious Greek Orthodox people were there by their hundreds. So there's a great move already. I don't see, you know, I think the coming persecution mm. is going to unite us very quickly. Wow. Uh, it's, it's really interesting. Um, I believe, naturally, that the communion is very, uh, I, I don't believe it's symbolic. I believe. Well, it, me too, you yeah, know, I was Because speaking. I grew up. Yes. With reverence when we would go up for communion in the church. Yes. Both Greek Orthodox and Catholic. Yes. Because I was allowed to take communion in the Catholic, you know, church too. Although because, you were Oh, because there was there was an agreement over it. Wow. That a Greek Orthodox could absolutely. In wow. in the Holy Land there was no difference. Are you serious? Absolutely. Yeah. Because this is also not a big thing that no, no, no. I didn't, I didn't uh, in the Catholic imagine. Church I went to the Catholic Mass. Uh, during the the week, because we would all go from school. Wow. And they served me communion like anyone else. And then I took communion, of course, on Sunday in the Greek Orthodox Church, so I didn't see the difference. But I'll, I'll tell you what I grew up with. I grew up with a reverence for it, mm. because uh, I was taught when I was a child by both churches, it is the body of Christ. Mm. It is his flesh and blood. Now, of course, we know it's in spirit, you know, because you, you, you still see the, the bread and you yes. drink the wine. And in, in those days, they didn't serve grape juice. Yeah. It was the actual Real wine. wine. Yes. And the Greek Orthodox would give it to you in a, in a, in a, in a spoon yes. with the bread in the wine. Yeah. And you yeah. took it from like the same the, spoon. The Bulgarian Orthodox do the same. Yeah. And the whole church used from the, the same, same spoon. spoon. Yes. So and nobody got sick. Yeah. And uh, you know what did they did in Bulgaria during COVID? Tell me. They they actually didn't stop taking communion. And when the, all the restrictions were, restrictions were happening, the Orthodox said, no, we'll be taking it in the same spoon like always. Oh my goodness. And people were lining yeah. up, yes. It and television. it was on television. And um, the, the big priest who was allowed from the, their synod to, to talk about it in public, he said, there hasn't been historically one plague when people took communion because it's the and body they, of Christ, of how course. can they get sick? And they couldn't get it's sick. It's for healing. But, yeah. what, what but they I, believe it more than most Protestants. Well, of course. Let me tell you, well, probably, uh, we can get into that in just a little bit. We may go a little over time today, it looks like. But a Catholic priest on the uh, EWTN network mentioned me, because I had said at Jesus' image that it is the body, it is the blood of Christ, and yeah. how more people are healed during a Catholic communion service time than they are healed in Pentecostal churches. And that's a fact. They've done many you know, studies on this, that more people get healed during mass, during communion, than they do in a Pentecostal church. And he repeated that. And then he said something that made me cry when I heard it. He said, may the, may the day come we can all unite wow. around the Eucharist. And I, why, you know, you know, I'm kind of choked up. And I thought, this is what, what, the, what the Lord prayed. One of these days, I'm going to meet that priest. I want to. I've been, in fact, trying to find, find him. Um, but, and if he's listening, please, will you please just get, get hold of me? Anyways, uh, but, but let me our, just say, okay, one, say one more thing about this. But I am still here because of my upbringing. And that's something very important to say. 
Ministers come and go sometimes, and you wonder why. It has to do with their foundation. When you come from that kind of foundation where doctrine is so important in your childhood days, that you, you were taught it by the priests and the nuns in the Catholic wow. Church and the, Orthodox, uh, and, the, and the Orthodox Church, we, I went to catechism in the Orthodox Church, and they were very clear on what they believed. Um, it gave me a lot of strength. We believed also so much in the reverence, not only towards the Lord himself and God Almighty, but towards the saints of old. Yes. Now, you know, of course, I, I don't believe in worshiping saints and so on, but I have a different view of Mary than most Pentecostals do. Mm -hmm. I believe that she is to be honored. Of course. Not prayed to, not, not uh, uh, worshipped, but she is the mother of Jesus, our precious Redeemer. And to ignore her, as sadly Pentecostals do and Charismatics do, I think it's a mistake. I was very amazed when I went one time, not one time, but I, I ministered in Rome, uh, I was, in, fa in, in fact, people don't, don't know this, that will interest you too. The people that sponsored my early meetings were the, were the Catholic Church, the Charismatic Catholics in Canada, were the ones that sponsored my early days. You, you're in shock, it looks like. <laughs> well, the Catholic I, Church. I'm learning so much about you that I didn't Catholic know, and I'm so happy Church that we had this conversation. In Canada. Paid your first crusades, your first meetings. No, wait. They were the ones to invite me to go minister. Wow! To the early to, to the charismatic Catholics, wow. I ministered to charismatic Catholics in Montreal. I went up north, uh, Sudbury, and other places. It was the Catholic Church that was inviting me. I spoke in cathedrals up there with charismatic Catholics. So I go to to one of the well. Let me go back to Rome because I I went to Rome. One of my largest meetings was in Rome, Italy. And the priest of the Vatican came. Wow. I have it all. It, it made Vatican radio. It was written in the Vatican newspaper. At the time, was Benedict was, was the Pope. And the, and, uh, the priest uh, of the actual church, the Vatican church had a priest. He came to my meeting, and he told the Pope about it. And I met with him. And, and he said this to me, he, he said, I told the Pope, what you have, we need in the church. So I've, ha I've had great open doors. We had 16,000 people in that, in that stadium and thousands outside that could, 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 could not get in. Some of my greatest meetings have been, have been where Catholics were in attendance because they believe in miracles. And I love the Catholic people. I, when I went to uh, Manila, I met with Cardinal Sin at the time. You know, I'm sorry he had that name, but there was his name. In the paper it says, Hen meet Sin in the <laughs> newspaper. But that was his name, Cardinal Sin, in the Philippines. And the first question he, he asked me, he said, are you coming to tell our people to leave the church? Wow. I said, no, your eminence, I'm coming. I'm here to tell them to go to church. Wow. And we, we clicked like that. And he and I ended up on our knees praying and I was delighted with what happened. A million people came from the, from the, in the Philippines. A million people came to that Yes, point. and a lot of them were Catholics. Wow. And nobody cared about what church you, you they all loved the Lord, and I gave the, the altar calls freely. No, nobody uh, said anything negative to me whatsoever. And the thing that is amazing, the, when I went to Italy, I, I, was, I was stunned. And, and to this day, I, I don't understand it, okay? They worship the Lord in a beautiful way. And at the end of the service, now they, they were healed and baptized in the Holy Spirit. And some of them began, they prayed to Mary at the end of the service. Wow. And I, 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 didn't know, yeah. I, you know, I didn't know how to respond. <laughs> and I asked uh, David Duplessis at the time, it was a precious man of God. I said, well, here's what happened. So. What do I do about it? He, he said, well, what did Mary say? What was the last thing she said? I said, uh, well, please tell me, because I wasn't thinking. He said, the last thing she said, whatsoever he says unto you, do it. <laughs> he said, she said, whatever Jesus said, do it. 
And so uh, I leave that with God. I, I, you know, they were healed, they were touched, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they still, at the end of the service, prayed to Mary. I, you know, don't know what to say about it even, even now. But the, but the thing is, they are God's people mm. that Jesus died for. We may disagree on some things to do with Mary, but I've had the greatest meetings with those precious Catholic people when, whenever I've gone. And I was just in, in uh, Europe recently and preached to a lot of Catholics. I'm going to Poland this year. Which is a very... A Catholic, Catholic nation. Yes. We don't talk about theology. We just talk about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And they, the, the way they respond is incredibly beautiful to watch. So... But my upbringing has, has a lot to do with it. So I wanted to ask you this question because when I study like uh, the Orthodox Church and I've been reading a lot about Orthodox theology and the Eucharist and And may I say the that thing just in case somebody's thinking. Yeah. When I heard the Catholics pray to Mary, that was years ago, mm -hmm. years ago. But, you know, to, to this day, I believe my call is to exalt Jesus mm. and talk about Jesus so that, that the eyes of all people would be on one person only, the Son of God, yes. Jesus. And that's it. So I want to ask you this because reading about uh, Orthodox theology, uh, what they believe about communion and different things and just being amazed also about the nature of Jesus Christ. Right. There, I don't think there is better... Christio Christology teaching than the Orthodox teaching on Christology. No, no like, doubt. I, I had some questions about the nature of Christ, very deep questions. I, I don't want to get into it in this conversation, but I had uh, I had my beliefs, and then I wondered if I was right, and then I found Maximus, who this is my name, mm. the confessor, who is one of the uh, church fathers of Orthodoxy, and his teaching on Christology is just amazing. So all of the different churches and, uh, and Christian movements are bringing something to the table. What are we bringing to the table? What is our value? What are we giving I believe the body of what, Christ and the world? What we need to give the world is who Jesus is. What mm -hmm. thinking of Christ is a very important question that the Lord asked mm -hmm. the Pharisees of, of his day. Mm -hmm. And today, who is he? Is he God Almighty? Uh, today, uh, people, I, there was a program recently on a major Christian network, which was very upsetting to me because they were talking about, is he God or the Son of God? And I'm thinking, what Bible are they reading? And these were preachers. Wow. Preachers. So I've been really bringing that back to the people to say, listen, what proof is in Scripture that Jesus is God, five, one, two, three, four, five. God must meet five attributes to be God. Mm -hmm. Number one, omnipotence. Mm -hmm. Number two, omniscience. Mm -hmm. Number three, omnipresence. Mm -hmm. Number four, unchangeable mm -hmm. and eternal. Jesus fits every one of them. Yes. He is almighty, he holds all things by the word of his power. He's omniscient because the treasures of knowledge are in him from what mm -hmm. Colossians says. Paul writes in Colossians. He's omnipresent because he said, I'm with you always. He's unchangeable. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's eternal. He's the I am, not the I was and I will be. So that is very clear in the Bible. Now, there are other, other, other things that I think we need to bring to them. Because today they need to understand his offices, not just attributes. Mm -hmm. For for God to be God, he must be creator. Mm -hmm. For God to be God, he must be preserver. Mm -hmm. For God to be God, he must impart life eternal, give life eternal to others. Well, there's more than that. But think about that the Lord himself, by him all things were made. He is the creator. We are, we, are, we are preserved in him because he holds all things we live, it says, and move in him. And when, when you think about the God who gives eternal life, he says so in John. And, 
and he has to forgive sins. And he, and, and he said in Matthew 9, clearly, your sins are forgiven. So uh, when, when people hear that, it strengthens them in the faith to understand that Jesus is God in the flesh. He is God Almighty. Athanasius said, remember the old, the old, yes. uh, the old heresy that he had to correct, and he was an, an Orthodox, you know, from Alexandria, and he said, our salvation would mean nothing mm. without God dying on a cross. He had to be God to die for us to be saved. It couldn't be just a man mm. to die. So how beautiful that God became flesh. He is the fullness of the Godhead in the flesh. Bodily, it says, clearly. So I think that's the message we need to bring to the world and to the church, especially right wow. now. Because with that, we win. Without that, we lose. If we bring any other message but Christ, who is he? We will lose. But when we bring Jesus as he truly is, God Almighty, there's victory in people's lives and our own life too. It's beautiful. And I think what makes it very real when you speak about Jesus or when we speak about Jesus is our personal encounter with the Holy Spirit. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, about your encounter with the Holy Spirit? I will, and then we'll pray, and we've gone way over time. But it's important that we that we'll talk because you... you you won't be back here for a while, but I'm going to be with you soon. Anyways, God willing, in the summer. Um, it's the Holy Spirit who reveals who Jesus is. You know, I would not have known the Bible as I know it today had it not been for the Holy Spirit. I remember a precious man of God back in Canada. Bob Tatinger was his name. Bob Tatinger was the the superintendent of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. And he came to my early meetings in those days. He was a precious man of God. So a, a group of pastors met with me and uh, advised me to go to Bible school. So Bob uh, came. He used to attend the Monday night they meetings. They didn't know you were in the real education. Well, what, what, what they... And, and in fact, <laughs> I, I agreed with them. I thought, you know, these were wonderful men of God and that, that believed in what was happening in our meetings in the early days in the 70s and said, Benny, you, you need some Bible education. It would be important for you to go to Bible school. I said, I agree. And somehow Bob Tatinger heard about it and he came to have lunch with me and he said, don't you listen to them. He said, don't you dare go. I said, I, I was in shock. I was like, this is the superintendent of the assemblies, uh, Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada, telling me not to go wow. to a Bible school. He said, it is evident the anointing is already on your life. Let God be your teacher. He said that to me. And, but but he, he was more specific. He said, let the Holy Ghost be your teacher. Wow. And let God guide you. And he was, he was uh, there was something about that man that, convinced me God was really using him to speak to me. Just the way he came across, the way everything about him was really precious and holy. And I, uh, I listened to him. Yeah, I've had some bumps the theologically when I was young, because happens to all of us. But a uh, dear man, years ago, Harry LeDuc said, Benny, uh, only a man who knows how to use an eraser will grow. Mm. Is that only a man that knows how to, to use the eraser will yeah. grow. He says, anyone who doesn't know how to use it is no good. And sometimes I've had to use my eraser to say, no, I don't believe that anymore. Wow. And you go on, you, you learn from it. But people today, especially and the that's legalistic... Real humility. Huh? That's real humility. That's real that's, humility. The, the, the legalistic people will not forgive you for anything you said uh, 30 years ago because you said it. And my response is, Please allow me to be, you know, a human being enough to grow, grow up. So we have to grow out of whatever we foolishly we said when we were young. And yes, I mean, I'm like, 
I'll admit that. I said some foolish things when I was younger that were not biblical. But I'm, I'm, I'm a changed man today because I, I know the Bible way better than I did back then. I see the beauty of Scripture in a blessed way. I, I read my Bible once every four months right through. So I am really, I'm like, I'm, I'm really in it, okay? And you've been doing it for the last 10 years. 10 years. Yes. O- over 10 years. Because I remember when yeah. we first met 10 years ago, you were telling me that you're doing that. Oh, but I'm still doing it. Wow. Because it, 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 it has so enriched my life to read the Word of God three times a year fully from, 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 cover to, from, from the first to the last chapter. And then I also attended, I literally went to Hebrew University online to study the Bible in Hebrew. And I passed. I was there for, I think, three years. And my beautiful, amazing professor, who was a wonderful lady, still there, still doing amazingly, uh, Sigal Zohar, she said to me, she said, you're my number one student when it comes to reading Hebrew. Wow. And I was happy to hear that. I, you know, I'm still, you know, reading the Hebrew Bible. There's a lot in it that is very, very deep. It takes a long time to understand it. It's not an easy, uh, uh, the biblical Hebrew is not as easy as people think. Wow. It's different than your your exactly. regular spoken okay. Hebrew. But I'm I've 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 become enriched by it, you know, spiritually. So learning Hebrew, even though I spoke it when I was a little boy in Israel, but learning biblical Hebrew has so transformed the way I see God, because wow. there's such depth in it. So, but again, you know, it's important to to keep growing. I'm 71 uh, in the natural, but in in the spirit, I've 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 gone way 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 past 71 because I'm I'm hungrier than I've ever been in my life about wow. to know who God is and His mind and His thoughts and His nature, and only the Bible can reveal God to us. We Listen, listen, and I want to close with one thing here that's very important. In the epistle of Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 1, he talks about the vision they had Mm -hmm. on the Mount of Transfiguration, Mm -hmm. how they saw the glory of God and heard the voice of God, and then he says, but we have a more sure word of prophecy. In other words, the Bible is more more important than what they saw and heard in that vision. So here he talks about the glory of God, how they, and I mean, I'm sensing the anointing only just talking about it. Yes. How they, they saw the glory. They heard the voice of God audibly. They saw the Lord literally transfigured before them. They saw Elijah and Moses. And yet he says, but we have a more sure word, a prophecy that you should take heed to, you should take heed. Don't ignore it, in other words. So the Bible is more important than any experience uh, that it's people so have. It's so important for, for the charismatic churches today. Well, today to the really charismatic people saying. are after signs and wonders wow. uh, and after feelings and emotions. They're not after the Bible, sadly. Not all of them, but it looks like there's a whole bunch of them out there that are going for that. The Bible is more important than any experience because experience will not defeat the devil. Only scripture defeats the devil. Because when Jesus was baptized, Mm -hmm. Satan comes and says, if you're the son of God, Mm -hmm. now think about this with me. When God spoke from heaven Mm -hmm. and Jesus was being baptized, God spoke and said, this is my son. Yes. The devil heard that. Everybody heard that. Everybody heard that. <laughs> Angels heard it. Demons heard it. And Jesus now the devil, that. yeah, now, now, now the devil comes and says, if you are the son of God, because he heard it, mm-hmm. turn this rock into bread. Jesus could have said, weren't you there? Didn't you hear God say, I am? But he didn't say that. Mm-hmm. He said, it is written. Mm-hmm. So by that we see even the Lord was saying to us in that beautiful scripture that his, that his word, God's word, is more important than what he experienced. Mm-hmm. So you cannot defeat Satan with experience. Mm-hmm. If anybody could, Jesus would have. So the word of God is all we have. 
That's what keeps us, sustains us, keeps us strong, and keeps us holy, walking in victory over, over, over sin. Your word I've hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Today you, you, you hear about you know, mental illness left and right. There's only one answer to mental illness. Great peace have they that love your law. <laughs> wow. Great peace have they that love the, your word, Lord. So mental illness, that's, that's, that's not peace. People are tormented by demons because they don't receive and understand or even have time to read the word of God. So true. They don't know the word of God. Well, how can they have peace without the Bible? I don't really get it. Look, look, you know, when, when I open my Bible, as I do every morning. Oh, I'm gone. I'm gone in a different world. And the peace that fills me is beyond description. An earthquake can hit and I won't care. (laughs) Because the word of God gives you incredible tranquility in your soul and in your life. So that really is what we have to keep repeating and repeating Mm -hmm. to the people of God so they would find that peace in Jesus through his Blessed word. And with that, we're done. Yes, sir. Uh, well, here, put, put the mic back to your, to your mouth. And I want to just say something about this young man. Pray for him. Bulgaria is a very special nation to God. And his church has a lot of young people. What, what's the, the percentage? I would say predominantly, probably 80% are younger. That's, that's what young I'm families, seeing. Young families, young people. That's what I'm seeing now around the world. I was just in Ghana with uh, Pastor Joshua Dag. 80% again are young people. Wow. I'm going to be in Kenya next week uh, for the crusade, big national crusade. The uh, first lady told me that 80% of the population of, of Kenya are, are young people. Wow. So that's interesting to hear that over and over. And the young people in, in Ghana stole my heart. I mean, it was incredibly exciting. Wow. They, they, they pulled it out of me in a way I have never known wow. young people to pull it out of me. And when I minister, even at you know, my children's ministry, uh, Jesus Image, those young people, I love speaking at the school, they pull it out of me. Wow. Hundreds of those young people are just electric in wow. the spirit. So it's, it's, it's exciting and it gives us all hope. Mm-hmm. So let's. Why don't you pray for them? Yes, pray for the people. Father, thank you so much for every single individual watching. We pray that you will reveal Jesus, Amen, to every single individual watching this program today. Thank you for Pastor Benny for his life and ministry. <clears throat> thank you for what he means for the world and for every person that is being impacted by the life of the Spirit and the message of the Spirit and the Word that He has carried for almost 50 years now. We bless every partner, we bless every giver, we bless every person who has been and is supporting this great ministry. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us. I know this was a little different today, but I'm glad He was here to pull some good stuff out of me. So you can give today. And by the way, remember, we are translating now the dailies into 12 languages. So, um, in fact, let me just show it to you quickly, and that'll be our goodbye. But you can give to help us do the translations. Uh, 12 languages. I'll be speaking um, already, well, not me, but the way they do it. I'm speaking Russian and Swedish, wow. German, uh, Hindi, Mandarin, you name Beautiful. it. Yeah. Spanish, French, incredible what they do. And so you can give on the platform you're watching me on, or you can go to our uh, uh, website, benin.org, or simply text BHM45777. So watch the, the way they're, they're doing it. Just a little clip here about it. that will give you an idea of what we're coming up with. Watch this. And I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. I'm teaching today on the blood of God. One of the most important teachings any one of us can bring to you. Una vez que comprendamos la sangre derramada de Jesús en la cruz, es importante recordar que Dios Todopoderoso no es el único de los más importantes.
。当我们明白耶稣在十字架上流的血时，我们也要记住，全能的上帝为你。A été crucifié en la personne de Jésus-Christ et a versé son sang sur la croix du calvaire. Ne akash aur prithvi ko srijit kia. Vah Bhagwan jisne Abraham ko chuna aur Abraham ko bulaya, jo Israel ko misruz, também derramou seu sangue por nós. Essa verdade tem um significado profundo e deve ser sempre lembrada. Ilahu al-Majd wa al-Khalq asbaha insanan. Ismuhu Yasuwa. Wa salabu al-Taftus. Ya evimeria e farmoste tus nomus tu theu. I plithora den ine tichi ala apotelesma i pakois. Shingan ju isho u yomu toki wa sugu ni ikimashou. Watashi wa anata no shinko wo tasuku tsumori desu. 信仰と共に動く時間をくださいよ。번영시킬것을믿게됩니다。번영은당신의것입니다。우리는이미선언했습니다。누구나있는사람이있고、att det finns de som sprider ut och ändå ökar sina tillgångar。en ger och ökar alltid。och det är den som。забывать об этом важном учении и его значении。Бог создал Авраам Риф. Год фюрте Израиль аз Египтен.